Prime Minister Eshkol dispatched Abba Ibn to seek the help of Israel's key allies. He wanted an international fleet to keep the straits open to prevent war. I've been asked by my government to uh, explore uh, what these governments intend to do in order to reopen this international waterway to what a situation of law. What do you want the United law. States to do, sir? Well, uh, I've come here really to find out what the United States <laughs> intends to do. President Johnson made it clear that he didn't want Israel to attack first. The president had said to Dean Rusk and me, and I'm going to speak rather crudely, get Eban in here, into the family quarters of the White House, so we can work him over. Because we had heard that uh, the Israelis were about to preempt. They were about to attack the Egyptians. Eban talked at great length and eloquently. He always spoke eloquently and he always spoke at great length. But what he had to say was very simple. This was a mortal crisis for Israel and he wanted to know what the United States was prepared to do. The president, he simply expressed skepticism about the idea that Israel was in danger. He said, you are not in danger. You are in a very difficult situation, but you are not in peril. He said to Eban, we do not believe that Egypt is about to attack Israel. Moreover, if it does, you'll lick him. To make the point, President Johnson asked for the Defense Department's assessment of the likely outcome of a Middle East war. We had concluded that if Israel preempted, they could win clearly in a period of about uh, seven days, as I remember. We had also estimated that if they did not preempt and Egypt attacked first, that uh, it would take somewhat longer, perhaps uh, 10 to 14 days. Then the president took out a piece of paper and started reading from it as though this was some kind of a sacred text. And what this document said was, Israel will not be alone unless it decides to be alone. If you go alone, you'll stand alone. That was a very cold-blooded statement. We will not come to your offense if you preempt. We cannot come to your offense if you preempt. As Israel received its warning in the White House, an Egyptian delegation was heading towards the Kremlin. We didn't even see Moscow. We were driven in cars with the curtains drawn, straight into the Kremlin. The Egyptians were self-assured. Shams Badran exuded confidence. He said that if war came, the Egyptian military could handle it. In fact, he described the army like a wild horse raring to go. But the Soviets warned the Egyptians not to be seen as the aggressors. Prime Minister Kasigan said, Tell Nasser, if he strikes first, he will escalate the conflict. He will provoke the superpowers. America will not stand aside. I said, we understand, but closing the straits isn't an attack on America. The Soviets made it clear they meant what they said. We asked about the arms contracts we had with them. We asked if they would hurry things up especially some spare parts we needed for our planes. We could have taken them with us in a bag. They were always asking for arms. Every high-level delegation would ask for arms, including Badran. They did not refuse to supply the arms, they just claimed they had none. I was really shocked. I thought, how can our Soviet friends treat us like this? War was at our doorstep. Nasser got the message. 
The Soviets would back him only if he did not appear to be the aggressor. His commanders were instructed to stay on the defensive, ready to absorb an Israeli attack. The Air Force chief jumped up. He said it will be crippling. He said, Mr. President, the first strike will be crippling. He said it in English. He meant that a first strike by Israel would cripple our Air Force. The commander-in-chief told him, if you let them strike first, you will fight only Israel. But if you strike first, you will have to fight Israel and America. But the war fever in Cairo had become unstoppable. Popular hatred of Israel, which Nasser did nothing to discourage, now swept him forward and drove other Arab rulers to his side. Even King Hussein of Jordan, for years at odds with Nasser, decided he could no longer stand aloof. In the morning I got into my uh, aircraft and uh, I flew it to Cairo. And I was met by the president. I was in uh, military fatigues uh, with my gun uh, on. And he said, well, I see you're carrying a gun. I said, I've been like that for the last few days with my troops. And then he made a strange remark. What would happen if we suddenly took you prisoner and uh, denied uh, all knowledge of your arriving in this country? Soon after, King Hussein signed a mutual defense treaty with Nasser and agreed to put his army under Egyptian command. We were on the verge of a, uh, uh, of a war. Therefore, any reservations I had uh, in the past uh, to uh, any troops coming into Jordan were removed as far as I'm concerned. So Israel faced the prospect of war on three fronts, from Jordan in the east, from Syria in the north, and from Egypt in the south. That was the time when Auschwitz came up. It never happened before. When people spoke, they said there was a feeling we are surrounded. We are surrounded. No one will help us. No one is helping us. And God forbid, if the Arab armies invade us, they'll kill us all. By this point, Israel had been mobilized for more than two weeks. All males aged 18 to 55 were called to serve. Most vehicles were requisitioned. Most factories closed. Israel could not stay fully mobilized for long. But still, Prime Minister Eshkol waited for the international community to do something. He came to military headquarters to remind his generals of America's warning. Israel must not go it alone. He told us that they were making diplomatic efforts in the U.S. and Europe. They were trying to reach a deal with Nasser. It made no sense to us. Flanked by Rabin. Eshkol found himself surrounded by generals insisting on a preemptive strike. General Peled was usually pretty quiet. Now he was shouting. He was actually shrieking. Why do you hesitate? Why are you afraid? I said... Eshkol, you have the best army since King David. If you don't attack, you will never be forgiven. If you do, you will be the conquering hero. To regain the confidence of his generals, Prime Minister Eshkol appointed a new Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, hero of the 1956 Suez War. Because the number and the, of their forces it's bigger than ours, but still, uh, I hope and, uh, that we can make it, but much depends, very much depends, upon where the battle is. 